In 2019, my guest today dreamed up the first ever pop culture daily show from a conservative perspective, Poplitics. From the hottest entertainment news to breaking stories and politics, she reported daily without propaganda. Alex's impact on young conservative women throughout Poplitics led her to create what she is calling the cute conservative movement. Her unapologetic approach to culture is defined daily by her wit and right of center lens. In 2021, she created the Spillover podcast And that, my friends, is where I met Alex Clark. She is unapologetically conservative. She loves to talk about what's happening in the culture, particularly as it relates to young women. She's a firecracker and a good friend of mine. She loves the Lord. You're going to love her too. This is going to be a fantastic conversation. Stick around. This is the Heidi St. John Podcast, and you're going to be encouraged. So, hey, Alex, girl, welcome to the show. What a welcome. Thank you very much, Heidi. I'm really happy to be here because you came on my show last year. And so now you're returning the favor, inviting me on. I'm very, very happy because your podcast crushes it. (laughs) So I can only hope to be where you're at in the next couple of years. Well, girlfriend, it looks to me like you're well on your way. You have been doing this amazing like intersection for young conservatives talking about pop culture and politics. And I'm just completely fascinated. I'm a super fan of what you're doing, as you all know. Tell my audience, This is your first time on my show. Tell us a little bit about you and kind of your passion, how you got to be doing what you're doing. Yeah, so my name is Alex, obviously, uh, Alex Clark. I am a contributor for Turning Point USA and also a show host. I was hired five years ago, plucked out of thin air from my pop radio job. I was a morning radio host for nearly a decade in some different cities in the United States. You know, the morning shows where it's like they're covering celebrity news and busting <laughs> cheaters and all that kind of stuff. That's what I was doing. Uh, started when I was 18. and Like uh, the TMZ of radio. It was the TMZ of radio, and I was sharing like all my crazy data dating stories. I would like have a first date and then I would come in and and I would dish on that, which didn't really help me in the dating department because then every guy in the city was terrified (laughs) to go out with me because they'd be like, is this going to end up on the radio? Much like like Taylor Taylor Swift. Swift, Yeah, it's going to be a song. song? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, might be why I'm still single. No, but um, uh, so I was doing that and then always openly conservative and it didn't matter. It was always like a unique thing about me that I was openly conservative on the air and off the air on my social media and things like that. But it was never a big deal until 2016, Trump became president. And as we know, that's really when you started to see the tides turning and all of a sudden it became criminal to identify as a conservative or somebody who had voted for Donald Trump. Uh, And Everything I I said at that point forward, if it at all showed any type of conservative or Christian ideology, Mm -hmm. I was getting into closed door meetings after we were on the air with my management. Uh, There was one time my boss had told me that we needed to let the Women's March become a proud sponsor on my morning show and I needed to broadcast live. Yeah, she wanted me to broadcast live from the Women's (laughs) March in Indianapolis. And I, I said... I'm not going to do that. And she said, well, I don't understand why. It's only about women's rights. It's not political. I said, it's absolutely political. Pulled up their website. Of course, the website literally says things like, you know, open borders. We support a woman's right to choose, have an abortion, you know, at at any stage, whenever you want. Uh, We're anti-Second Amendment. Like, everything was political. Uh, And I was like, which of these um, main points of their philosophy that they're fighting for would you say is nonpartisan? She couldn't answer. So then she agreed that I didn't have to sponsor them. So that was a win for me. But it was the first of many things Then I was asked to host events with uh, trans women. And that was the last straw for me. Cross-dressing women. I can't keep doing this. Yeah. Yeah. So I I was like, I can't do this. And um, then there was a morning where I casually had mentioned it was so quick. It was like a one sentence thing. I had mentioned that I was an NRA member and a mother listening in her car, I guess, had her kids in the car, (laughs) called the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. So the government 
to complain about me said that I was a danger to children being on the air. Now, anytime, if you're not familiar with how the FCC works for people on live television or on live radio, anytime there is a complaint made against a personality on air, the government has to investigate it to see if I truly did break a law. And so our lawyers had to ask me, what, it, what is it that you said, you know, and, and do this whole investigation. And I was like, I'm done. Yeah, I'm out. I'm done. But I, I loved what I did. I loved getting to talk pop culture. I just also didn't like having to hide this part of myself yeah. that was conservative. And I started shopping around this idea because I'd been in radio for so long. I knew people that worked in conservative talk radio. And I, I love this idea of doing a pop culture show from a conservative perspective. And I had this idea of E! News and Fox News having a baby, what would that show look like? <laughs> and I started asking friends in talk radio in the conservative space. I was like, well, what do you think? Do you think a show like this would do well? And, you know, I'm thinking of like within a lineup, if it goes from like Sean Hannity to Laura Ingram to like this little pop culture show, maybe at night or something. And they were like, I'm sorry, Alex, like it's a, it's a very cool idea, but there's just not an audience for that in the conservative space. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that was wrong, Heidi, because I was this girl in my mid-20s who was craving to have somebody in the conservative movement covering these stories and these celebrities that I really enjoy, but giving a different perspective. And I remember that summer, Miley Cyrus had licked uh, an abortion yep. cake. It was like uh, abortion yep. is healthcare. It was this viral photo. And every pop culture outlet was covering it with these glowing reviews like, isn't this so strong and brave? And I was like, is the is the strength and bravery in the room with us right now? <laughs> um, and I was like, why is nobody covering this? So the problem was, is that conservatives would cover stories like that, but nobody was doing it from a place of like, I like this celebrity. I love her music or whatever, but I disagree. Here's why. I just, I wanted like a non irate critique of pop culture from somebody that was like, I like these celebrities too, but here's why they're wrong. Because like Ben Shapiro would cover that and stuff, but he doesn't like Miley right. Cyrus. I yeah. do. So it was just, a, it was a perspective I was looking for that didn't exist in the movement. And um, so I knew that the this, this advice that I was getting, that like you this is a great idea, but it's really a pipe dream. You should let it go. was just not good advice. And I had gone to the Young Women's Leadership Summit in 2018 that Turning Point USA puts on. It's a huge women's event. And it was so encouraging to me about talking about how um, figure out a way with your God-given mm -hmm. talents in your space to also get to share about, you know, conservative ideas. How would that work? And I was like, well, geez, I love that conference so much. I wonder if Turning Point USA would be interested in doing a show like this. So weirdly, <laughs> a couple weeks before I decided I was going to quit, even though I didn't have any plan, C Turning Point USA had DM me on Instagram and we're like, hey, we're a huge fan. We've been following you, you know, since you came to our event last year. And we wanted to see if there was a way that we could work together. And so I got on the phone with them, pitched them the idea for this little pop culture show. I was like, I want it to be a social media show. It'll be geared towards young women. Um, Ten minutes every day. I'll cover like the top five stories of the day. But it will be pop culture without the leftist propaganda. Yep. That was my slogan. Yep. And I, I wanted to call it politics. So a mix of po politics and pop culture politics. And uh, they were like, let's do it. Let's try it. Um, it was really scary for me because I was leaving everything I knew. I had built a huge career in radio. I had a number one rated morning show in Indianapolis. It was syndicated into other cities as well. And uh, I was scared and I didn't know a soul in Phoenix, which is where Turning Point USA is based. But I felt the pressure of, okay, uh, at the time, this was 2019, and I was like, next year it's going to be an election. I really am going to hate myself if I am, you know, censored yeah. or gagged Sideline. and I can't even mm -hmm. share. Yeah, if I can't share what I believe in such a crucial election year. And um, so I was like, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to take a chance on Turning Point. I love the organization. They hired me. I launched Politics. It blew up. It was it was the first pop culture show in the conservative movement. And then a couple of years later, I launched my podcast, which is where I get to explore more serious topics and interview experts like Heidi about uh, homeschooling and, and health and wellness or true crime. I've had true crime survivors, just basically different topics that can help heal what I call a sick mm. culture, whether that's spiritually, emotionally emotionally or physically, because I love a lot of like health and wellness topics. So um, that's what I've been doing. And, and that's my story of how I got here. <laughs> well, it's kind of amazing because the spillover is 
is doing awesome. And you really are, you're, you're jumping into some pretty deep water. I mean, I'm, I'm watching you. I follow you, you know, like a crazy stalker friend that I am. And you're talking about, you know, the pill and what it's doing to women. Well, you know, I, I came of age in the eighties and the late seventies and the early eighties and everybody just, you got, you know, you got out of high school and you got on the pill and that's what they've been doing for generations. And to so to see young women now coming out and saying, actually, you're hurting yourself. And actually, let's talk about what's what's really going on. And you're interviewing some pretty provocative guests on your show. What are some of your favorite moments? Like when you think about, oh, man, this was a really good one. What what comes to mind? Because uh, I can think of a couple of them. I actually engaged over the issue, the topic of um, epidurals at one point. OK, yeah. There was somebody on there and I was ta- because I had uh, had seven babies and I had six epidurals. And I'm telling you what, I was thankful for every single one of them because I had such a hard time with my first baby. I went in there and I was like, going to be all natural, going to do well after 24 hours of, you know, this just intense labor and finally get to pushing and four and a half hours of pushing. They were like, and I'm exhausted. I don't think I can do it anymore. I'm on the verge of a, of a C-section. And finally they said, what if we gave you some pain relief? What if you just did an epidural and let's see how your body responds? And Savannah who's now 32, was born uh, less than 40 minutes later. Because my body wasn't fighting this like, uh, you know, my body was like, oh, this is what we're doing. You know? So for yeah. me, it was just such yeah, a different- Yeah, a year older than me. Yeah, then. I know. Remember, you and I talked about this. You could be my daughter. It's making me feel pretty bad right now, but whatever. But I just thought such an interesting, uh, I'm so glad that you're talking about these things and it's it's exciting for me to watch uh, the rising generation grabbing hold of this stuff and saying, hey, let's talk about it. Yeah, that episode that you're talking about was with Dr. Stuart Fishbein. He is an OBGYN. He is such a crazy story. So he was an OBGYN working at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles for a really long time. And he started to feel really... Um, he, he started to have conflicting feelings about just the way that we were running things traditionally with labor and delivery. There was a lot of things that he just thought were unnecessary. He thought we were, uh, you know, pr- uh, offering C-sections when totally. we shouldn't be. Yep. He thought that they were, uh, you know, th- the way that we were asking women to give birth, I guess, like lay this way, do this. You can't do this. You're not allowed to do this. Um, oh, you know, you're having your, your, your baby's in breach. Well, then you have to have a C-section, all these different things he just, he disagreed with. So he left the hospital, he left Cedars, and then he decided to open up his own practice where he was working closely with midwives in Southern California. And he was going to people's homes and helping them do home births on, uh, breach deliveries, twin deliveries, but from home, which, you know, allegedly you can't do, right. but he's like, no, you absolutely can. So that episode was interesting because I just kind of asked my audience, hey, submit every question that you have about breach birth, twin birth, and also just all natural birth, home birth, and I'm going to have him answer. It was like a two hour episode and it was huge. People were really interested in that. And I have uh, a midwife coming on. I don't know when this is airing. But I have a midwife coming on this season who is uh, going to kind of do the same thing, but from a midwife's perspective. He's he's an OBGYN. She's a midwife. So yeah, the birth stuff mm-hmm. has been huge. And it's funny, you bring up birth control. So that, I, I really thought when I started talking about birth control, um, I started talking about it like two years ago on social media. And then a, about a year ago, I started really talking about it on my mm-hmm. shows. And this, I thought was going to be this really easy win, like bipartisan win that all women would agree with me. That has not been the case. And I could not believe out of all the things that I've said that are so controversial, (laughs) you know, coming after Black Lives Matter, all these things, no write-ups from mainstream media. As soon as I started talking about birth control, Heidi, Big Pharma sent out their dogs the after me. They, I had NBC News. Yeah, the goons yeah. came after me. NBC News, Washington Post, Media Matters. All of these people were saying that I'm promoting right-wing extremism, uh, that I am, am spreading misinformation that's dangerous to women. Why is it that there's a conservative agenda against birth control? And I had to start going on the offense like, uh, hello, 
it was the left, it was actually the liberal feminists of the 70s who first spoke out against birth control and said, you've had us on this pill for 20 years. We've never been sicker. We've never had more health issues. You need to start putting warning signs of side effects in with the pill packet that were prescribed because until 1970, they didn't have that. It was just, you get this pill and you have no idea what the consequences could be. So it was because of these feminists that we have those warning signs in the first place, but it was really a leftist fight at first. And then because I happen to be conservative and I'm just saying I agree with everything that they were saying back then against the pill, all of a sudden now it's a, you know, a right wing extremist issue. And why is it that all these conservatives are started to talk about it? Cause I started talking about it. Uh, probably me and Evie magazine mm-hmm. were the two outlets on the right that really started talking about this a couple years ago that everybody else has jumped on. And it's just sad. It, it, it really proves how science is bought and paid yep. for. The mainstream yep. media, of course, is bought and paid for. Their biggest advertisers are Big Pharma. And so Big Pharma is saying, you need to go after these people because this is hurting our bottom line if we lose a generation of women that are not prescribed the pill. Because as you were saying, you get prescribed this pill. Every woman basically is offered it when we're teenagers. 100%. And then from there, it's like some of the side effects being, you know, uh, you're at risk for quadrupled suicidal ideation, anxiety, depression. Oh, well, okay. You have those breast cancer. You have these side effects. Now let's prescribe you another anti, let's prescribe you an antidepressant then to help with those. Uh, and then, you know, because you're on birth control for usually a decade or more, these women have hormone issues going on that would indicate to them, Hey, there's something I need to work on so that I can get my fertility in check by the time I am ready to have kids and start a family. But it's going completely undetected because birth control is a band aid that hides the side effects, but doesn't let you actually fix whatever the root cause of the problem is. And so then you're having this explosion of infertility. Uh, Birth control isn't directly causing the fertility, but it's hiding and masking, you know, what your fertility problems are so that you can't fix them uh, until it's too late. And so then you have, you know, these women spending 20, 30, $40,000 on IVF. It's just this huge cash cow for big pharma to get these girls on birth control as early as possible, which we're now seeing at 11 and 12 Mm -hmm. years old, I've heard. So Mm -hmm. um, it's really really concerning. And I was like, man, there's never been, it's never been more obvious to me how disgusting and evil big pharma Mm -hmm. is. And of course they're uh, neck and neck, like with big food. So those two subjects have been on the top of mind for me on my podcast in the last year of, of trying to expose these two industries as much as I possibly can with my female audience who is going to be raising the next generation. It's really women that hold the keys to the culture war. If we get to the women, then we can change the culture because it's us that's making those little decisions every day. What goes on our children's plates? What are we putting into their bodies? You know, who's going to be educating them? It's the women who make those smaller everyday decisions that add up to creating what, who the next generation is going to be. So it's so crucial to get that information out there. And I don't want conservatives to be, I don't want conservative women to be as hyper-focused on the like, the po- politics side of things, of course, is important, but I think it's even more important to get to them about the culture and how sick that is. Yeah, and I and and actually they're primed and ready to listen now, especially after COVID, right? I think there's more distrust of big pharma now than they ever has been because we all saw the curtain get pulled back and Father Fauci, the high priest of the branch Covidians up there with Donald Trump, who still hasn't walked back his uh, his you know his really super fast rollout of this untested vaccine, which really has killed people now. And so you're watching, I think, an entire generation going, oh hey. Maybe I need to do my own research. Maybe I shouldn't just trust it when my doctor hands me a package of pills. I think it's interesting, and you rightly pointed out, that uh, doctors are prescribing the pill to girls as young as 10 and 11 years old now. And I think in some ways, if you if you look at how that is coinciding with the left's push to teach children consent starting in kindergarten, right? And we can talk about this all day long. It's one of the reasons why I'm such, I'm so passionate that parents take their children out of public school. Watch what's happening in Southern California. Watch what's happening across the country with the fight over whether or not uh, we should be teaching young children uh, what consent means. Well, we all go, well, of course we want to teach them consent, but they're not teaching them consent so that they can protect themselves. They're teaching them consent because it desensitizes them. And if someone were to attack a child, who has been taught the the or supposedly understands what consent means all of a sudden you can't sue somebody like that you can't go after someone when the kid 
clearly, right, the schools will say or the government will say, well, they know what consent means. And I think it's really interesting that we're teaching these young girls all about consent at the same time that they're trying to get uh, birth control pills into the hands of 12 year old, uh, 12 year old little kids. You're so right about that. And it reminds me, I interviewed this woman. Her name is Monica Klein. Are you familiar with her? Yes. Uh huh. Okay, so she, if you if you don't know, she was working for Planned Parenthood for a decade, and she was the person that Planned Parenthood would send into elementary schools to teach kids about sex. And you think, okay, teaching kids about sex, elementary school, so probably like fifth grade, and you know, you're explaining, you know, sperm right. is the egg, blah, blah, blah. No. Her job was to teach kids how to enjoy sex, have pleasurable sex, give better oral sex, nine-year-old girls. Uh, It is one of the most shocking conversations that I've ever done on The Spillover, Uh, one that haunts me. I, I... it's very rare that I am so disturbed by a conversation that I, mm-hmm. I just feel sick for days. And that was a conversation with her. I felt sick for days and days and days after hearing that because I just, I knew it was bad. But until she explained to me just how evil it is, I've just, I, it is, um, it's, it's just one well, of those it takes really your haunting away. conversations. Yeah. yeah, it takes your breath away because these are children. We're talking about children now. And the left is going after children with some sort of a reckless abandon that I have never seen before. Going after them in our libraries, right? Look what's happening with the American Library Association, one of the most corrupt unions ever to exist in the United States. I put them, I put them probably third after the National Educators Association. And these people are targeting children largely with sexual ideologies. And we're injuring our children by body, soul, mind, and spirit. They're not ready for this stuff. And actually, I'm not ready for it either. I i look at half the stuff they're teaching these kids. And I'm like, oh, hey, I could have gotten the rest of my life without hearing that. But we're, we're teaching this stuff to children. Have you had Katie Faust on your show yet? Oh, yes. She's been on twice. Oh, and man. So I Katie- love that woman. I love her too, but here's what's interesting. So Katie Faust has a new book and uh, it's like Raising Conservative Kids in a Woke City, I think it's yeah, called. Yeah, she's and from I Seattle. Love the book. Yes, mm-hmm. I love the book and she's from Seattle. But I thought of you immediately after reading that and interviewing her because she's living in the same city as you and her position is keep your conservative kids in the public school system so that they will be strengthened to fight back. I love Katie, but I disagree with her on that because- yep, I do too. I don't want my kid to feel the burden of having to be some conservative martyr. And I also just don't think that it's possible. It is just the stuff that they're going to be faced with is so evil on a day-to-day basis. I just don't want them in that environment. My position is conservative parents have no excuse. I don't care if you are a one-income household, if you're a single parent, find a way to homeschool. People are doing it. It is possible. So my position is we should be homeschooling at all costs and putting more pressure on conservatives to homeschool at all costs. That's so interesting. I wondered if you knew who she was. I so do. do you I love about Katie. her argument. Well, I, I disagree. Katie and I have talked about this. She's been on my show and we've talked about it. I actually had her come here and uh, she taught some really awesome classes to the teenagers here about um, the sexual ideologies that are coming at them in the culture from a position of not just a biblical authority, but also natural law and trying to equip children to and teenagers especially to be able to engage with some degree of confidence in the arguments against you know so-called transgenderism and all that kind of stuff. So I agree with Katie on a variety of things. I love that she rightly points out that almost everything that's coming at the culture right now, including the sex trafficking that we see at the southern border, is all aimed at, wait for it, children. And what's happening in our public schools is aimed directly at children. Same thing with the National Library Association. Same thing with the American Academy of Pediatrics. These guys are disgusting human beings that shouldn't be practicing medicine, and yet here they are injuring children. Katie and I disagree with each other on uh, on the issue of public school. And I think one of the reasons why it has worked for Katie is that Katie is one in a million parents. There are not very many parents. Yeah, there are not very many parents. They're going to be all up in your grill like uh, Mama Faust will, right? And so she has had some degree of success with her kids in the public school. I believe, and I think I can make a pretty strong case for most parents use the schools as 
as a vehicle just to babysit your kids. So we yeah. drop off the kids so that mom and dad can go to work, right? Because that's been the big lie forever and ever that you got to have two incomes and that everybody, you know, everybody wants the nice house and the nice car and everything. And we're sacrificing our children in order to get it. Katie really believes that kids should be salt and light, Christian kids especially, salt and light in the Christian schools. I disagree. You can't be salt until you have it. And most of these kids don't have the, they don't have this the emotional or spiritual maturity to fight back and against an agenda that is literally being crafted by people that are three times their age and been in this movement for a really long time. So I think it's too risky. And so uh, Katie and I love each other. But we've We've agreed to disagree on the topic. I love that. That is, I would love to hear you guys like do a sit down. Uh, I'll have to go back and listen <laughs> to that because I have thought about that for so long after interviewing uh, you and then interviewing her on that. But yeah, she's so interesting because uh, she also, I, the other episode I did with her was all about, uh, you know, her views on IVF and big fertility is what I like to Dude, call I it. I totally agree with her with IVF. I, and in fact, I think it's mind blowing. Uh, you know, I talked about it on my podcast a couple weeks ago and man, I got hit really hard. People are like, I can't believe it. I have a daughter through IVF and you're saying that these babies don't matter. I'm like, no, I'm no, saying we're, we're saying. literally selling human beings. That's yeah. what I'm saying. We're selling human beings. We're creating them in Petri dishes. What about, you know, all these babies that are frozen in perpetuity? And the, and the embryos that are discarded and destroyed, we're not talking about that. We just talk about the beautiful miracle of life that IVF offers. Katie has really done a great job of bringing to the surface all the underbelly of IVF. And it really is big fertility. Yeah. I mean, are children a gift from God? Yes. But also... If you are justifying, you know, any means to an end, what what are you doing to get there? And, and what's the moral gray area on how you are going to achieve that? I, it's right. something that we need to talk about. That for sure. So you brought up like what's been some of the spiciest stuff that you've covered on The Spillover? Definitely the IVF <laughs> conversation, fertility conversation with, with and surrogacy. We did gay adoption, all kinds yep. of stuff. That is one of the most spicy episodes I've ever done. Uh, covering daycare has been one of the biggest topics that I kind of brought. Because it's a sacred brought. cow in the culture. Yeah, It is. Yeah. And this is one of those things. So I, Heidi, I have tried to explain to my audience, I'm like, I need you to understand that the tendrils of feminism go so deep that yes. all of us in, for, in some ways have been affected by it. And all, a lot yeah. of us that are conservatives, we don't even see the impact that it's had on our belief system. Things that you're like, well, that's not feminism. That's not, that wasn't affected. It is. This belief that like daycare, it's just stay home or do daycare, that it's just an yeah. either or option, yeah. that there's not a hierarchy of childcare, that some things are better or more ideal than others. That is definitely a product of feminism, you know, yeah. pushing women into the, the workforce. So just give your yeah. kids to anybody to be watched. And then all of the attachment issues that have come from kids being in daycare from such a young age that we've seen and, and mental health issues, I definitely believe uh, it, for the last couple generations that that Daycare has played a huge role in that. But um, I interviewed Dr. Erica Komazar on that subject. I interviewed Suzanne Venker, Phyllis Shafley's niece on that subject. Oh, and wow. those have been huge topics. Uh, you should try to get either of them on your show if you haven't. Oh man, I'm no, I have, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to um, hook up with you when this is over to get some of these get some introductions from you because I would love that. I I saw and I wonder if you saw it. I saw on Instagram a couple of days ago um, a video kind of making the rounds, and there were just different clips of moms coming to pick up their kids from daycare at the end of the day. Have you seen it? Yes, and the kids uh, just burst and into tears when they and finally see the mom. they're sobbing, and it's like, yeah. And the and the author of that video was saying, "Look what you're doing to your kids." We're saying, "We love you. We release you. We love you. We, le you know, mommy always comes back." It's like you're creating this maternal bond, and then you're breaking it, right? And we do this over and over and over again when we drop our kids off in daycare, and it really is sad. And these women are giving up the best years of their lives to the workforce. And the most amazing thing that we could be doing, which is, you know, which is raising these little human beings and helping them become the, the men and women that really that God has created them to be, that rests with parents. It doesn't rest with the schools. It doesn't rest with your pastor. It doesn't rest at the daycare. That is the responsibility of parents, particularly mothers, who are the ones historically who have stayed home with children. And now we have a generation of children who desperately need their mothers and mothers who desperately long to be with their children, but they've been told they just, they can't do it and it's not their responsibility. And I love what you're doing because you're bringing awareness to the stuff and you're telling these young women, this is actually good. And these guys have been lying to you. 
Yeah, daycare was created to be a last resort for our widows, uh, for extremely impoverished families uh, that both parents do have to work because they are so in poverty. That is who daycare was ideally supposed to be. What we have done as a culture is we've told families that even if both parents don't need to work, uh, just put your kids in daycare anyway. Um, and what we're seeing from that is in the first three years, which Erica Comazar goes into, so does Suzanne Venker in both of my episodes with them, and they have all the science behind it. I don't remember all the statistics off the top of my head. But they talk about how in the first three years, that is that is when your baby is developing uh, either a healthy or an unhealthy attachment. And that ha- strictly has to do with their bond with their mother. And so yep. they are looking for you in those moments of being uh, of being scared, of crying, hungry, sick. They want you. They don't want a stranger. And they're trying yes. to form a healthy attachment bond to a primary caregiver. The thing about daycares is that the turnover rate is so high, they will attach to somebody and then three weeks later, they're gone. And now they have to attach to somebody yep. else. A couple months later, they have to attach to someone else. The cycle continues, cycle continues. So it's creating all of these unhealthy attachments within a child. Um, and so what both of them are saying is that not that moms can never work, but that in the first three years of a child's life, you really need to consider either not working at all and being home for those first three years full time, or you need to dial down your hours very, very part time, try to work from home, work when they're sleeping, figure out a way so that you are with them the majority of the time. And then yep. if you absolutely have no other option, you have to work, which I think a lot of families need to put pen to paper and, and try to figure out their budget a little bit more. I just I just do not fall for this lie that it's absolutely impossible to be a one income family. Every single one of my friends that has uh, four plus children now at this point that's married, they're all one income family, stay at home moms, and they make, you know, very, very average American salaries. I mean, probably between sixty, eighty thousand dollars a year max, mm-hmm. and they're mm-hmm. able to do it with all those kids. So um, some less than that, some forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, and they're doing it. Um, so I just don't believe that it's that impossible. Number one, but two. Now I'm forgetting <laughs> what I was saying. Um, but also, what was I saying? Well, you know what? I I'm going to jump off of something that you said really quickly because you okay. were talking. You have it. Write it down because you were talking about how we we need we you know, people think they need two incomes. Well, we've heard that about public school forever and ever and ever. Like you got to send your kid to public school so mom can go to work. But what do we find out in the middle of the scamdemic? We learned that for a virus at the ninety nine point nine percent survival rate, we'd figure it out. Yeah. We brought our kids home and we've heard forever. Oh, you can't do that. Or I don't know how to do that. But where there's a will, there's a way. And I think what I hear you saying and what I've been saying now for many, many years is I'm done making excuses for this garbage way that we have of treating family, which is the most sacred institution that we have in the United States. And it comes second, third and fourth after our jobs and after our entertainment budget and after the vacations that we want to take. And then we give the leftovers to our children and we wonder why they're entering into adulthood broken and confused. It goes back to the parents and the parents need to be held responsible. And I I just am I'm just very, very tired of hearing people make excuses. Yes, there are the, the, uh, the points in which someone has to put their child in daycare, but it should be the exception and not the rule. And it's just right. been flipped on its head. Yeah. So now I remember what I was saying is that there there is a hierarchy to ideal types of child care. The number one uh, that you should try to aim for is mother is home with the baby first three years. After that, if it can't be you, it should be another close family member that is going to see that child forever on a you know daily basis, a grandparent, uh, an aunt or something like that. Uh, third would be a nanny in home and Fourth would be a shared nanny. So maybe you have a neighbor or a couple neighbors uh, and you guys can share a nanny right there within your neighborhood and one of your homes that the child's familiar with. Uh, Then you go to daycare very, very, very last. So that's really the hierarchy and it shouldn't be controversial. It's just true. We know factually of how this impacts the child's development. But yeah, this is one of those things where... uh, The feminist movement has tricked so many women, including women that identify as conservative, into believing this lie that you cannot survive without, you know, offsourcing your parenting to somebody else. And all of this, what you're saying, is a tactic for them to get their claws in as early as possible. But we really have to be more protective than that. 
Yeah, it's true. And I think we've lost that. You know, women have lost that protective nature. We are mama bears by nature, right? And we're watching our children having, I mean, I'm I'm shocked and amazed. You and I were talking about this a little bit before. You know, we're watching now uh, boys. I just saw this happen in the Sheraton High School here in Oregon just a couple of weeks ago. This dude won the 200 meter race. I mean, we're talking by a half a football length. This kid blew the other girls out of the water because he's a boy trying to compete against girls. And you know, the thing that was most upsetting to me wasn't the fact that the dude was running the race. Like that's obviously upsetting, but was upsetting was watching the parents sitting in the stands doing nothing. If that was my daughter, I will, I, I mean, I'm here to tell you right now, Alex, I'd have been down on the field because that's oh, it's wrong. It's wrong. And I just wonder when are our kids going to be precious enough to us, right? That we actually stand up in their defense and we, we're careful again about what they eat. We're careful again about who they hang out with, right? The Bible's pretty clear about that. Bad company corrupts good character. And yet our kids are gone from us eight hours a day, five days a week, nine months out of every year, and we don't know who they're with. And that's the bottom line. Parents have got to start taking responsibility again for what's happening to their children. Right. And then the conservative Christian parents, their kids grow up and, and their, you know, their kid is in Antifa and they're going, well, I just don't understand what, what happened? happened. We had we had a Christian conservative home. What happened? How much yeah. time did they spend with you compared to these freaks on That's a day to day right. basis? hundred percent. Hello. Yeah. hundred percent. And when they, and if they make it out of high school with their, you know, their parents' conservative values sort of hanging by a thread, whatever the schools didn't finish, the colleges and universities will. And yeah. parents need to understand, like gone are the days when you can just send your kid to a college, especially a Christian college. I mean, that, I have a bigger beef with so-called Christian colleges that are actually woke and stupid than I do with a state school where I know my kid's going to be assaulted for his faith or I know he's going to have his, uh, his ideas about uh, politics challenged. But they go to these Christian universities and they're just Christian in name only. They're not Christian universities. And suddenly the kid's not prepared. And that's where a lot of these kids are getting messed up. I talked to a mom out of Seattle just a couple of weeks ago, and she had a similar story, homeschooled kid. She said, we had, we passed the head knowledge, but we failed on the heart knowledge. We sent um, our kid to a Christian university and he basically, you know, their daughter basically came out with a, you know, a blue haired, uh, a blue haired, you know, 23 year old with a degree in lesbian dance theory. And the parents are like, what the heck just happened? Well, you can't take your hands off the steering wheel so soon anymore. You've got to understand because these uh, attacks are all aimed at young people. It's astonishing. Yeah. Even Texas Christian University, TCU, yep. they have, I think, like a drag course class or whatever. So exactly what you're saying. And, and this is the problem. Every time that we talk about, I know in my episode with you talking about homeschooling, the, the number one rebuttal is that you have all these conservative parents go, okay, but what about the private schools? The private schools are the same. They are no different anymore. There is no safe ground. There is, it's not yep. a higher, there, yep. there's no hierarchy. Yep. It's it's public school or homeschool. I'm telling you, it's not public school uh, is the worst and then private school is better and then homeschool is best. Private school and public school are equal now. Maybe there's a few far in between. Somebody, every time, you know, somebody will be like, well, in my town of a population of 38, we have this one room <laughs> schoolhouse and it's not woke. I'm like, great. Okay, well, let, we're not okay, talking, good. we're talking about the majority. The majority yeah. are, are the same. And yeah, you hear the same stories about, you know, the school was working with my kid on, on, on using different pronouns when they were at school and then yep, they wouldn't yep. tell me about it. They were helping them uh, get hormones or recommending places to get hormones. They're all doing it. Um, yep. I hear the craziest stuff from my private school private Christian school parent followers as I do mm -hmm. the public school ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had a friend recently who had her kids in a private Christian school just outside of Denver, Colorado, and she pulled her kids out. She's like, they were, they were training our kids in how to use pronouns. So I went to the principal and I was like, what are you doing? Like, first of all, your syntax is terrible, right? We don't use plural pronouns to describe a single human being. You're going to mess my kid up and he's going to have the language skills of a three-year-old child who probably actually probably younger than that. And these guys were like, well, we're just trying to equip your kids for the world that they're coming into. No, I want you to equip my kid to stand against it. I don't want you to equip my kid to blend in to it. I don't want you to equip my uh, my kid to be a jellyfish when he gets out into the culture. You've got to give these kids a spine. And most of these schools are not doing it because they're afraid that they're not going to get the money that they need to keep their doors open. It's very difficult to keep the doors of a private Christian school open. Listen, I graduated from a private Christian school way back when dinosaurs roamed the earth in the 80s. 
And I will tell you in a lot of ways, because I came from a really rough home and a, a pretty bad environment, I think in a lot of ways that school saved my life. I'm still, I still talk to the principal of that school, but a lot of the students that were in this private Christian school, their parents sent them there because they were having trouble in the public schools. So they're having all these, you know, all these issues with their kids. Well, we'll send you to the private school and the private school will fix it. And the parents just assume that I send my kid to a private Christian school and they're getting a stellar Christian education. But oftentimes they're surrounded by kids who are dealing with all kinds of issues and they're not getting the training that the parents think they are, but the parents are doing what they always did, which was to check out. And that's where the problem comes in. These parents who are not engaging with their children because we've been trained that what we do when they hit the age of five is we drop them off with somebody else. Yeah. And the other hang up that a lot of parents have is like, well, I can't homeschool because I just, I really want my kids to be normal. And I always <laughs> respond to that. I'm oh. like, have you, so have you seen anything? You seen I, I just saw, uh, yeah, I, uh, what, what is normal? Because normal in public schools today are, I just saw a video last week of uh, some high school kids in Utah that were walking each other on leashes like dogs on school grounds. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if that is normal, then Thank God. I don't want my kids to be anything like that. I want them to be as far away from normal as possible because normal in the United States of America now is degenerate. It's degenerate. Oh, so that is what the new normal is. So we have to stop this. I, I just want to fit in. You're, you're telling your kids to sacrifice their values and their morals to fit in and fitting in right now is evil. It is satanic. Yeah, it really is. I'm curious. I mean, you you've got your finger on the pulse of the young women who are identifying as conservatives in this country right now. I'm going to be joining you guys at the Young Women's Leadership Summit this year, and I'm so jazzed. I'm really excited to be there. What's your? You know, we got about two minutes left. What do you? What do you think? Uh, in terms of when, when someone says to you, where are we headed? Do you have hope? Are you, do you feel discouraged when you see what, um, what's the questions that are coming out of the age of women that you're targeting? What do you see for the future of the country? Do you feel encouraged? Do you feel like, oh man, we got so much more work to do? What do you think? I'm feeling encouraged. Now, if you would have asked me this a couple years ago, I probably would have said discouraged. But in the last couple years, especially in the last year, obviously we've seen, and some of it's a little bit silly, but we've seen this resurgence of like this homesteading aesthetic on social media and, and traditional wives and, and homeschooling. Oh, the and, trad and, wives. Don't get me started. Eh, I, I don't actually like that. Some of that, some of it is super cringy and it's not actually cringy. like traditional wives in the biblical sense, but, right. but I know for my friends, it is, they they really do take it seriously and that they're taking their kids out of school. They're joining these amazing biblical homeschool co-ops uh, across the United States. They are learning how to live off of their land. They're getting off big pharma. They're going into uh, more functional medicine. They're looking into homeopathic remedies for different things. Um, and I have hope for that because that is really the the crutch of being conservative, right? Is not letting the government tell you Come how on. to raise your kids, uh, you know, w- what to do with them health wise, uh, what to feed them, what's appropriate to feed them, because all of that is is just garbage. Uh, all of it is a lie. And so I love that these women are like, you know what? I've seen what normalcy has done, where it's taken us as a culture, and mm. I want to do the complete polar opposite of that. I'm building a garden. I'm doing all this. Um, and so I love that. I love that. I. The the homeschool co-ops that my best friends are in right now are so cool. Like I tell them, I'm so jealous. If I ever leave Scottsdale, which I love where I live, but if I ever were, I'm going to move to middle of nowhere, Kentucky for this <laughs> homeschool co-op because they're doing things <laughs> so right. And it's just this encouraging group of women. Uh, and so they, we're seeing this across the country and, and, and that really does give me hope. And that's really the theme of the Young Women's Leadership Summit this year, which you just said you're going to be speaking about. Out. So what is the Young Women's Leadership Summit? It's the biggest conservative two-day conference in the country uh, for women of all ages. You could be high school through grandmother age. Any age, you will have a mother's room if you want to bring your baby. Um, but the topic is back to our roots. And roots is kind of a play on word because the theme is very like prairie, garden in because you know the word roots but also traditional values so we're going to be exploring all of these topics daycare biblical parenting homeschooling uh we're going to dive into birth control with dr jolene brighton who's like one of the leading experts in debunking the lies that we've been told for generations on the pill um we're talking about IVF with Katie Fowles. She'll be there. So th- there's so many incredible speakers. Dude, that's where we should do something from there with me and Katie. That'll be fine. 
Yes, Light you should up. pitch that. Pitch that to the <laughs> events team, Heidi. That would be so crazy. Light so, it like, up. all of this is... Um, the whole event is going to be topics that Heidi and I quickly brushed over today, but uh, on a larger scale with all of these different experts and women who are really the pioneers in all of these different areas for culture. It's so exciting. Oh, and it's it's June 7th through 9th, San Antonio, Texas. And you can get tickets to go uh, YWLS2024.com. And you can use code Alex. It'll get you 25% off your general admission ticket. So hopefully Heidi can put that in the show notes, the link to the tickets. Absolutely. Nope, I absolutely will. And I'm excited. I, like you, am encouraged. I think, I think people are waking up. I think they're starting to take responsibility for their own lives rather than just taking direction from people that they don't know who they've never met. And uh, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged by what you're doing and how fast your audience is growing. I, you know, I, my generation, we weren't asking questions. And I think that's what hurt us. This generation is asking questions and we need to be ready to give an answer. So I'm excited about it. Uh, Alex Clark, you are a national treasure. Thank you for coming on the show today. It's just been a delight to have you. Thank you so much, Heidi. I really appreciate it. That's the nicest compliment ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you in San Antonio, girl. Okay. Sounds good. All right, you guys want more information on Alex Clark, head on over to HeidiStJohn.com forward slash podcast. You know the drill. You can download the show notes and I will link back to that registration link for the Young Women's Leadership Summit in the show notes today. Thank you guys for listening and I'll see you right back here again at the intersection of faith and culture.